That's a lot of subs. But it didn't feel quite right to make a video on just that. So I figured let's do one last round of secrets first. Number one. When Gale teleports in phase two, you might have noticed a tiny visual detail. He's actually summoning himself with a white summon soapstone underneath you. If you're looking for a lore explanation, the White Summon Soapstone item has always referenced the convolution of time, and it's always referenced the link between undead. And Gale is a character that can be summoned by you all throughout the DLCs, so it does make some sense that he could abuse this link to your character. Gale actually has quite a few little visual details that really flesh out his character. Uh, for instance, his soapstone messages look unlike any other, and they emanate those same skull fumes that he has throughout all of phase two of his boss fight. So what are those skulls? Well, there's nothing in Dark Souls 3 that defines them, but they are pretty much the same as those summoned by the Executioner's Gloves in Bloodborne, which gives us some idea of what they were thinking with this asset. In Bloodborne, they are said to be the wrathful spirits of the past, and considering they also bulge outwards from the purging monument, I think it's fair to say that Gale, who has probably consumed half the souls of the world by this point, it's fair to say that he is overflowing with the spirits and the curses of the past as well. Another thing deep within Gale, if you look really closely at his character model, is a perfect circle that looks identical to the Dark Sigil, which is the mark that resembles the brand of the undead. And if you are hollow, devoid of humanity, did you know that you will no longer cast a shadow upon the ground or a reflection in the water? I think we can explain why this happens. In the Black Flame item descriptions, um, the, and I quote, impenetrable flame of humanity is said to be a weighty physical force. So. It makes some sense that losing your soul, or your humanity, would make a hollow more ethereal, and thus they would be incapable of blocking out light and producing a shadow. But I'll admit, being shadowless is somewhat of a strange addition, um, especially considering it's never directly mentioned, and out of all the Souls games, this I believe only occurs in Dark Souls 3, but I can't really imagine them putting this in by mistake, can you? Another thing I'm always unsure of is this interaction with the Firekeeper. So it occurs when you return here, still drenched in the wax of the Grand Archives. She turns away, presumably in distaste, for she does exactly the same thing when you wear one of the rings that mark you as someone from Londor. And as we all know, the Hollows of Londor were widely detested. So assumedly she's turning away in distaste here as well. And assuming this isn't a mistake, why? Why would she turn away from a wax-headed scholar? The only theory I have is this. To a degree, Filing Shrine functions as an extension of Lothric, a kingdom devoted to the linking of the fire, which is a goal that's upheld by the three pillars, the knight, the priestess, and the scholar. And of the three, there is evidence that the scholars started to go against the knights and the priestesses, and Lothric's fire-linking legacy in general. For example, the first of the scholars is said to have doubted the linking of the fire, and the Blessed Weapon enchantment was created after the scholars acquired the Grand Archives, which apparently marked the strengthening of ties between the other two pillars, the knights and the handmaidens. So, it's quite possible that the scholars were the third pillar that was sort of responsible for the fall of the entire structure, so to speak. And it's quite possible that this small, seemingly insignificant interaction where she turns away in disgust could be a third little nod towards the treachery of the scholars as well. But that's just a theory. And it's one of those things where it's really hard to know whether a detail is meant to be important from a lore perspective. And the same is definitely true when it comes to the pictures in the official design works. Take for example this image of Filianor, where she holds the egg, except the inside of this egg is overlaid with the stitched crystal lizard hide of a transposing kiln. Look how similar these two are. So, the transposing kiln that we find within the curse rotted Greatwood is said to hail from Corland, and it's stitched with crystal lizard hide and is capable of extracting the essence of a soul. 
And of course, the egg in-game doesn't actually have this stitched crystal lizard hide transposing kiln within it, but still, even though this was changed, the picture still gives us this rare piece of insight into what the developers might have actually been thinking when they designed Filianor. It tells us that at some stage, Filianor may have been linked with Corland, and that at some stage, the transposing kiln here may have been the method by which the original Dark Soul was hidden within the Ringed City. Also notable in the design works is a fourth shrine of Farron that doesn't appear alongside the three others in Farron Swamp. The three existing shrines depict the four kings, Nito, and the Witch of Isolith, and this fourth removed shrine depicts Seath the Pale Drake. The last three things I want to talk about are a few speedrunning tricks. First, the fast wyvern kill. Basically, you run to the elevated part of the stairs, you hope for the horizontal fire breath, and then you perform a jump attack with the right timing. Then the fight's over. Next, a jump skip to skip Irithyll, and this one is best performed with a keyboard so that you can get some better 90 degree angle changes. By nestling your character in this corner, you align the camera just like this, then you sprint into the corner, and then abruptly run forward and jump at the second step down. From here, it's this short, glitchy walk to a distant mana bonfire, which skips basically all of Irithyll to get to Yorm. And finally, a little trick that completely immobilizes the watchers of Farron. Walk into this corner, then align your base vigor health bar just so it's at the edge near this candle. Then tap forward on your keyboard, commit to a fully charged R2, then a single R2, skip the cutscene, quit out, get back in, and the fight is yours. So. I'm not going to go into great detail on these, because honestly, if these strats have piqued your interest in any way, then you can find them all on the Speed Souls wiki, or you really should watch them all performed firsthand by the speedrunning community this game has on Twitch, because if you haven't yet delved into that side of the Souls community, do it. I've been waiting for an excuse to shout them out for ages. You can watch these streamers for hours on end and never get bored because it's so exciting watching them break the game in such controlled ways, and you never know when they're about to break a new world record, so it's really exciting. And speaking of breaking records, uh, hitting new milestones, we hit a million subscribers after the last video. At the end of the Soul Saga, no less. Like, that feels really neat to me. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I remember when I started, and I couldn't even comprehend 500 people. Like, try to do that. You can't imagine 500 individual people with all their complexities. Like, you just can't do it, I don't think. And I don't think you can truly conceptualize what that amount of people means, um, let alone a million. Um, I did this notepad thing I saw Reckville do once, uh, just to help me visualize what a million looked like, but it just made things worse. But you know, Yes, a million is an insanely striking number, and you get a thrill when you see it on your channel page for the first time, for sure. But then the next day, it hits you a little less, and then the next day it hits you a little bit less than that, and then the next day it's just normal. You know, like every other milestone you hit in life, no matter what it is. I don't think you can do YouTube or anything, really, just for the milestones or the money you make. It just doesn't fulfill you. It's not really enough in my opinion. So what's really grounded me as I continue doing stuff on this channel is thinking about the individual behind the screen. And you can get really caught up in the statistics, but I think that the statistic that really represents the individual, like you behind the screen or me watching a YouTube video, is one stat called viewer retention. And it's basically how long the average viewer will watch your video. And this is what I care about. I care that 60 to 70 percent of you guys stay until the very end of the video, and from what I hear, those are pretty good stats. Um, because more than subscribers, I care that you get excited when you see one of my videos uploaded. Um, I care that you don't feel like quitting the video halfway through. I care that you might walk away from the video and enjoy the Soul series that tiny bit more, because that's a feeling I can grasp and empathize with, and it matters way more than a million subscribers does in my opinion, because celebrating a million sort of devalues the individual behind the screen, and the individual is what matters, right? 
I could go on for a long time. I could talk about how great it's been to be a part of this community and what it's like sharing how amazing these games are. Like, I could really go into depth on that. But you guys know, you guys can empathize with that feeling, I'm sure, because you know how great these games are and what it's like to share it with other people, maybe through this YouTube channel or maybe people you know in real life or maybe people you talk to online, people you do co-op with, you understand what it's like. And I just want to thank you for being a part of that for me. So E3 is around the corner and honestly, I feel like the leaks this year for From Software might be better than what they could possibly announce. <laughs> just look at this. So I'm pretty sure they'll announce something at E3 that will be relevant to us and to the channel, because while they have said that they aren't working on any more Souls-like titles, uh, like Bloodborne or Dark Souls, they said they are working on something that will be interesting to the Souls audience. So in my opinion, I feel like they won't stray too far from the Souls-like sort of genre they've created for themselves. And you can't really take everything they say about the future of From Software at like face value, you can't take it without a grain of salt. Because remember, just before they announced Bloodborne, Miyazaki said he wanted to work on something happier and lighthearted and a more warmer universe. And then he announced Bloodborne, this gory, gruesome title about werewolves and aliens. So you never really know what they're planning, but I'm sure it will be interesting to some of us. So as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.